Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us both on Facebook Live and through Zoom, if anyone um, participates via Zoom. I'm Arielle Gold, the National Co-Director of Code Pink, and I am joined by Salome MC, who is an Iranian hip hop artist. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So I want to start out by just asking a bit of about your history, how you grew up and how you got involved in hip hop. Because I think for so many people, the idea of an Iranian woman um, performing as a hip hop artist is just inconceivable. So if you can give us a little bit of background. Yeah. Um, so actually, when I started um, rapping, uh, there weren't um, many people doing it. So uh, me, along with a few other of my friends who loved hip hop and mostly listened to American hip hop, uh, started Hip Hop City in Iran. And this is uh, back in early 2000s. Um, but now there are many, uh, many uh, people who you know, of either gender uh, making hip hop music. So it's a different times now. But going back to um, how I got involved, um, you know, I was from really early on, I was uh, really involved with um, um, street art. Uh, so before I got involved with music, I was doing uh, graffiti uh, in the streets and um, just really loved hip hop culture and hip hop music. Um, but interestingly, I was exposed to it not through American hip hop, but um, German hip hop, which uh, like a Turkish diaspora group lived in who lived in Germany. They made uh, hip hop music, and um, it kind of the mixtape got to me when I was really little, and I really loved their you know message of being outsiders, and and, and it really spoke to me. You know, in that age when you're a teenager. Um, and uh, we moved around a lot when I was little because my dad is a journalist. Uh, so I always, everywhere I went, I always felt a little bit like an outsider. And this was both inside Iran and outside. Uh, so that, that spoke to me and that hop. Uh, I slowly started writing my own uh, poems and then trying to rap them, but it was all in Farsi and I didn't have any uh, uh, reference to. I was just doing it by myself. Uh, but then uh, internet started to take off in Iran, uh, again, early 2000s, and then there was these Yahoo chat groups, and uh, there was this social media called Orkat, I don't think it's around anymore, but um, that's how we kind of met people who loved hip hop and were making um, Persian hip hop. Uh, and we kind of just started the scene and, you know, started recording and uh, after that I just kept making music. Now, I was reading about some of the music that you made during the Green Revolution. And uh, to let our listeners know what the Green Revolution was, for those that didn't, if you could let us know the background a little bit of that and how it impacted you both personally and as an artist. Uh, so the Green Movement was, um, so this is 2009. You know, we have presidential elections in Iran every uh, four years. And uh, in 2009, we had uh, an election, and this was the second term of Ahmadinejad, who's um, probably, um, you know, people who <laughs> follow politics back in the day, they will recognize his name. Uh, he was very outspoken <laughs> at the time. Uh, it was uh, during, the, he, he ran for the second term, and then his um, opponent was um, uh, Musavi. And a lot of people, kind of, you know, younger people, educated people, uh, were leaning towards voting for Musavi. And um, the um, the expectation was that he was going to get elected. He had really massive following, but um, he wasn't. Ahmadinejad got elected a second term, and I think a lot of us felt that there was a fraud involved. And later, it was kind of confirmed, but you never know. Um, but you know, there was a lot of emotions involved after that, and people we well went into the street and started asking what happened, where did our vote go, and how come, how 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 is that possible? And our questions and peaceful um, 
you know, protests was met with um, crackdowns and it was a really hard time for, um, for us who wanted to, you know, younger people who wanted to get involved in the, in the political scene of Iran and get some changes from within uh, instead of, you know, wanting foreign intervention or, you know, wanted peaceful change, slow change reforms. And that fraud basically crushed a lot of our hopes for that. So it was really hard time. And basically after that, um, a lot of um, artists, activists, um, journalists left Iran. Uh, it was uh, it was dark times, but yeah, I, I made um, different music in that time. Uh, um, it was kind of respond responding to how the you know the, the feelings were high, and I was responding to uh, to I was younger too, so I had a lot of um, I had more time and energy to respond really quickly. And looking back, sometimes I think, okay, maybe, you know, that I, mean, I, I don't agree with everything I said, but um, yeah, I made a lot of music in that time, um, almost yeah, now, weekly. I want to let anybody who's watching know that we have put a link in the comments to your website so that folks can check mm -hmm. out your music firsthand. And uh, I want to bring this into current times. We hear the Trump administration, Pompeo, Brian Hook, and others, you know, talking about how much Iranians need to be rescued from <laughs> yeah. the constraints of their own uh, government. And, and, and you speak, you're very outspoken, you know, critically um, from then through now to things that have gone on in your government. And we've, you've recently had some crackdowns. Um, could you talk about this idea of uh, rescuing Iranians and what the response is from Iranian society? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, I can't speak for all of Iranian society. It's huge. Iran is big, diverse, not just in America or any other country. And with a country as ancient as Iran, you'll have a lot of different um, ethnic groups living. Um, but as a, you know, as a, someone coming from the middle class, educated background, um, I, I probably speak to a lot of people in a similar position that we we know history and we know that uh, interventionism is what brought us to the place we are right now in Iran. So more intervention uh, is not the solution to anything. Uh, and uh, definitely um, no one wants to be rescued. We are quite capable of rescuing ourselves if uh, our um, social political evolution is not constantly attacked and uh, intervened by foreign powers. And I think these uh, sanctions that are put is a so-called maximum pressure campaign that is going on right now is a interventionism. It's another type of interventionism is again, kind of uh, suffocating the the how uh, the the natural course that our the people's movements can take in Iran and change the society we can, we do have the power it's just our tools are constantly taken away from us so uh, that that is the problem here and definitely we don't need to get rescued we are <laughs> you know we've, we've been through a lot as as a nation and uh, we, we, we had a revolution in, in our history and uh, we had one of the first democratic elections in the region, uh, you know, back in the 50s. So it's, it's not, it's definitely um, not something we need that to, to get rescued. But yeah, that, that kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, talk is just, uh, just, just one of those Republican or neocon talking points to, uh, to justify this um, constant intervention in the region for definitely not any, any uh, humanitarian reason, but completely um, political um, interests. For anybody who's unfamiliar about that first democratic election in the region in the 1950s, that was Mohammed Mossadegh, and he was ousted by a US and UK coup. Um, major act of U.S. intervention and regime change that really upended Iranian society. Now, so many of us Americans, I think this is on the mind of, of so many who may or may not be watching, but so many Americans think of Iranian women as uh, 
women who are incredibly oppressed and always um, forced to be covered. And in fact, um, headscarf is law in Iran. But if you could speak a bit about women, the women's movement in Iran, feminism in Iran, Iranian culture around women and uh, what that was like for you growing up. Yeah, um, again, uh, one thing that um, I think needs to be pointed out in you know, talks like this, when we, when we say something like, you know, women in Iran or, you know, women in Syria or anywhere, um, it's, it's such, it's, comes, it's already approaching from such a broad um, uh, angle that is impossible to not fall into a trap of generalizations and, uh, you know, stereotypes. Um, Iran, again, is such a big country uh, that um, with so many, you know, tapestry of ethnic groups uh, that um, women in different parts of Iran will have very different experiences. Uh, so again, I can speak for my own individual experience. Um, uh, on top of that, if we put aside the, you know, cultural differences in different parts of Iran, uh, again, there is a class system also that will affect everyone's experience. And that's just a global thing everywhere. Um, it's actually kind of interesting because, uh, you know, during these re recent, like last couple of months, because of the escalations that happened between Iran and the US, I've seen this internet meme going around that says, uh, you know, you have more in common with the people of Iran than the billionaires in America. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and I kind of want to add on that because, um, um, it's definitely true that uh, a middle class experience in America is very quite similar to a middle class experience in Iran, and the billionaires in, <laughs> and billionaires in Iran live a lot better than any middle class in America. So it's really uh, there, there's definitely a class system issue. It's you know it's that's going to affect your experience as a woman too. Um, so, but if you're you know if you're a woman. Uh, living in Tehran or in a, any bigger city, we have quite a few of them. Um, you're educated and you're working and you're coming from a family that um, supports you and people around you. Your, your, your experience is not going to be um, something very different from how you, you know, anyone, you know, any middle class person living and working and raising a family in any part of the world. I lived um, you know, in Japan, I lived in Turkey, now I'm living in uh, Seattle. And um, I would say that from, you know, just thinking of from a broad perspective, my life hasn't been that different in terms of the resources that I have, things that I have access to, the support system that I have. Um, but then obviously you have some, you know, difference in the, the details for sure. Um, then it comes to, um, I definitely feel more safe to speak my mind and, you know, write uh, my opinions in, in online because there is definitely censorship in Iran. Um, that and but again, you think how many people that really affects is people like us, you know, musicians, activists, journalists, but a normal person who's just living their life and trying to live as a family, they don't feel that as much. Uh, so it's, it's, it's again, the, that, so the experience of living in Iran can be quite different for different people uh, based on what they do. Uh, but I would say that it's not, it's not, you know, the average person is not really living that differently from um, someone else living in America. Could you talk a little bit about how the sanctions um, have affected middle class Iranians and any effects they've had um, as we have watched these crackdowns recently um, from the Iranian government? I mean, it's so quite interesting things happened the last few uh, months. Sanctions definitely affected Iran in a really negative way and it affected normal people. Um, I think a lot of people on top can actually get quite rich and uh, from the sanctions uh, because, you know, they control the borders, obviously, and um, uh, they can smuggle, they can, you know, hoard things and it, it, it can work for a lot of um, people who don't have, uh, for people who have uh, that authority and power. Um, but then regular people don't, they lose, basically the middle class is just disappearing because of these sanctions and uh, people are losing access to um, 
basic needs. I mean, I'm t- I was talking to a friend of mine as a doctor in a hospital and she was saying that we don't ac- have access to some basic important like anesthesia related um, drugs and certain things that was used to be really rel- readily available are not anymore. And honestly, a part of that is sanctions, but a part of that is also uh, just again, the Iranian government's mismanagement. And I think there is a very direct relation to the fact that uh, the, the the sanctions is not only on the on the um, uh, you know goods that coming into Iran. The sanctions means cutting off Iran from the global stage, cutting off the uh, Iranian the people on top, the 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 rulers of Iran from the global stage. That means that they can do whatever they want. I think when when you when you when you when if Iran gets stops being treated like a pariah and those leaders stop start actually interacting with the other world um, leaders, they will have to have to change and uh, take a more, uh, you know, standard tone of how they treating people. And that's, I think that's one of the more uh, severe results of the sanctions that it has caused the uh, very um, uh, fundamentalist uh, parts of the ruling system in Iran now really become emboldened and empowered and uh, doing, you know, they, they have been arresting even more now than before, than when the nuclear place uh, deal was in place, when the sanctions wasn't this high, when Iran uh, was more open to the world. Now it's, it's, it's gotten a lot harder in so many other ways. Um, it's not only the access to the goods, but definitely that too. If you could talk a little bit about the social movements in Iran. I was there in October and one of the experiences I had um, that was a very short trip to just tourist locations, but there was uh, one moment when we were at a a bridge in Isfahan and and we witnessed a a young woman um, dancing and and singing, which is prohibited uh, for women to do by themselves in um, in Iran with her uh, male partner filming her and it was it was exciting for me to see um, social movement and uh, protest taking place, you know, uh, in the wide open in front of tourism. And if you could talk a little bit about that for your upbringing as well as what you know about it currently in the midst of all of this pressure from the U.S. Yeah, you know, so yeah, like in a, in a country like Iran, these um, you know simple things that get taken get taken for granted uh, in other parts of the world can really be turned into uh, beautiful, you know, acts of defiance and, uh, you know, movements. Uh, so that th- that kind of, you know, so I was doing graffiti, for example, when I was really um, early on and I didn't realize, like, like looking back, I'm thinking, wow, that was a big like rebellious. I didn't maybe realize when I was doing that, but uh, in the context of Iran and how, uh, the, the society is built. It's not only the ruling class system, but you know, just just there, there's a part of the society is also really conservative. Um, but these younger people uh, who are more globalized and they use internet and they have access to a lot of inter- information and they interact with everyone from all around the world. Um, they're definitely uh, they're <laughs> they they um, uh, the way. Uh, they express themselves are um, m- more more in line with um, how you know how the world it, it, how the world uh, the youth in the world are doing it, uh, and it's not that different at all. Uh, so yeah, you know, the, we have street dancing, we have street singing, music um, was. Um, it, it's, it's getting a little bit harder now. Again, I think since the maximum pressure campaign, there's more crackdown. But after the nuclear deal during Obama time, we had this opening, lots of concerts were happening. There was like great uh, cultural uh, shifts. Uh, and people were really hopeful that um, there's going to be, you know, these slow changes are going to lead to, you know, bigger changes and cultural shift in the society, political shift too. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a setback right now um, because of the sanctions and just, you know, going back to treating Iran like a complete pariah. Could you tell us a bit about some of your musical influences, especially any from the U.S.? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, as I said, I, I started uh, listening to hip hop from you know more European hip hop, but later um, as I um, discovered more and more, I came to love uh, some hip hop from America. And, you know, I love Public Enemy um, and uh, Immortal Technique. Uh, they, they, they are my favorites. Um, uh, I listen to, um, I'll say most of Lauren Hill is a big influence. Um, uh, but it's not only hip hop though. So I, I listen to all kinds of different music. Um, those are the hip hop ones that I can name, but um, I love progressive rock uh, bands from, you know, uh, again, I guess it wouldn't be American, but you know, I love Pink Floyd. <laughs> uh, and you know, a lot of, and this is one of those things that um, a lot of uh, Iranians, uh, young and even older generations, uh, they will tell you, you know, they, they love Pink Floyd or, you know, all these, um, um, bands or movies that have such, you know, significant um, influence in the society, in the Western society, it's, it's kind of similar in Iran too. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. So it's not, it's not that different. Well, these are the, the voices of musical social change movements. Um, <laughs> Roger Waters is right now in the news for yes. his support of the uh, Palestinian people and taking the backlash for Roger that. Roger Waters is great. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, could you talk a bit as well? I mean, I've read some of the things you've said about coming of age um, as a woman and how that influenced you musically. And also, um, you know, I'm familiar with how important poetry is to the Iranian people and how Farsi is a language that facilitates yes. that. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about that that influence on your music as well. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, for, um, poetry is a big, big tradition in Iran going back centuries. Uh, and everyone in Iran, I think probably all, almost all households ha will have uh, the uh, poem co collections of Hafez and Saidi. These are, you know, great Iranian poets. So we kind of grow up with that, uh, just having rhymes and verses in our lives and you know kind of looking at life through metaphors and similes so from that perspective it wasn't really hard for me to start writing um, music um, and just you know finding that connection to hip-hop uh, definitely the the biggest part for me that um, that I chose that genre was the uh, you know it being um, an agent of change and when, when it first started in America um, and different parts of the world, people who adopted are usually people who, uh, you know, felt like the outcast of the society. So that, that was what, why, why I um, was drawn into it. Uh, you know, as a woman, being a woman everywhere is hard. <laughs> so that's not different in Iran. Uh, again, I had this, I think uh, lock an opportunity of having a supportive family. You know, my mom is a writer and my dad is a journalist. So I grew up in a storyteller uh, family. And when I first started, they were afraid for me. So they wanted to see, okay, what are you doing? Who are you doing it with? So I had to uh, introduce them to the people I go to studio with and my friends and kind of give them a peace of mind. But I had their support when I started doing it. Um, people around me i was lucky i had the support so i didn't never really felt that um you know i'm doing it as a woman in a society the patriarchal society is not only you know the culturally uh, still uh looking at women as, you know, differently than men but also some of that is ingrained in the constitution of the in the in the, in the, in the uh, of the country and um so kind of had that privilege um, and that, I think that helped me just push forward and just keep doing what I was doing without, um, feeling that I was breaking any grounds, but apparently I did. And this is great. Cause looking back, uh, you know, there are all these new, gener there's like third, fourth generations of folk musicians now, and they all come to us and say, okay, you know, like, because I listened to that, I thought, okay, I can do that this, even though I had this and that obstacle. 
and I'm happy that you know that kind of breaking that ground uh, helped help for now we have many I mean still not as many uh, as it should be but there's a lot of girls who are making music in Iran now uh, in the hip-hop genre but you know again uh, all over the world is uh, I think women are minority in the in the scene so Absolutely. All over the world, we are trying to get more women into prominent positions from the arts to politics. And um, thank you for being uh, one of the trailblazers um, of that. If uh, you could let Americans know um, your wishes for how to help the situation within this campaign of of maximum pressure, which... um, we really consider a form of warfare. This is economic warfare. And um, how can we help? I mean, I've been thinking about it for last for the last two months, really seriously. I mean, first of all, I've been always against sanctions. I mean, Iran has been under sanctions. I lived most of my life under sanctions and cut off from the world. And um, I know this is not the way, that's not the way. Um, uh, to bring to bring um, peace for sure, but change, um, natural political political change that we need in Iran. Um, one thing that is troubling, um, as an Iranian living in America, especially at these times, talking has become um, has to be done really artfully because. If I say, um, when I criticize American government's actions, it can be easily people who are living in Iran, you know, the ruling class, the regime, that can easily be interpreted as supporting that regime, but it's not. And on the other hand, if I come and say um, something that criticize, when I'm criticizing the Iranian government for the crackdowns and the, the brutality, on this side, the Trump uh, administration can easily, and the Trump supporters can usually use, use that, uh, you know, as a talking point. And it's really hard to walk this line in between and saying that's not right and this is not right either. There is a path here, path of integrity and the path of peace, regardless of who's ruling and doing what. Uh, this there, there is a right way. Stop interventions. Stop sanctions. Start pre treating countries like a pariah. And just saying that though, right now, uh, I have to immediately come and say, but Iranian government is bad and it is doing, if I don't say that immediately, it's really easy to come and say, oh, are you getting paid by the Iranian government? And it happens so quickly. And, and then on the other side, then we have that, that because if, if you start criticizing your government, immediately it becomes like, oh, you know, are you a ne- neocon? <laughs> it's, uh, so it's, it's such, for people like us and, you know, for, for, a, for organizations like Code Ping that want, just want peace, period, uh, without all these, you know, the, the people who are trying to use talking points and just, uh, just use one sentence and uh, advance their agenda based on that. It's, it's been hard. So I'm still trying to find how to express and come to this uh, place of um, not giving any heed to that and that and just bring people to understand that there is a right path that um, says all of those are wrong. <laughs> it says lift the sanctions and allow the Iranian people to reform their own society and build their own society and uh, stop threatening such war mongering and so on. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and I want to let everyone know who's watching that uh, you can go to codepink.org slash Iran. Um, the latest thing that we're working on is city resolutions to prevent a war with Iran and calling for the sanctions to be lifted. Um, again, that's codepink.org slash Iran. Could you tell us um, what you're working on musically or politically in this current time? 
And um, I did put a link in for your website, but any other suggestions you have that way about how people can access your music and your words and follow you? Uh, yeah, I um, yeah, my website is good. I also have a social media, only Instagram right now. Uh, I'm working, my, my work rate, uh, you know, goes very slowly. <laughs> uh, I usually uh, release albums. Uh, but every now and then, you know, I, I release singles. I make my own music. I have a studio and just production, everything. I just one man army do everything by myself. So that's why it's, it goes really slowly. But um, I, I my last album I released in 2017 and I'm aiming to release another one in, within the next year. Um, but, you know, the, the recent escalations and what happened in Iran, I mean, we, we, there's so many things happened, like with the escalations, and then we had um, the protests and then the crackdown. And then we had the shooting of the Ukraine plane. Uh, so, so much is happening in Iran and so much is happening between Iran and America. And as a person who lives in America, whose you know, husband is American, whose son is American, I am experiencing a lot of emotional turmoil and also trying to make sense of the situation. So I'm trying to put those into the words and I am making some music right now to um, turn this just cope with what's happening really. Um, so yeah, I'll be happy if, you know, just people keep an eye on that and um, support once I release that. Uh, and I'm working on a few other more longer term projects um, that um, it's all, you know, kind of part of this being of um, immigrant in my new life in America and um, just exploring that. What are your thoughts as I know I've been paying attention to um, students at Buhu who have been coming in uh, from Iran, students and others um, to study here in the US or for other reasons and have been horrifically uh, detained at the airports. And what mm -hmm. has that been like for you uh, as a Iranian immigrant? Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, first of all, when the first news about, um, I'm sure you read that, but, um, I live in Seattle, so the Vancouver border in Blaine is right here, three hours drive, and uh, looks like uh, the uh, they they had a mem memo from the government to uh, just detain uh, people who were born in Iran, regardless of their citizenship status, at the border, and a lot of people were detained for, and questions for hours and hours, even even if even though they were American citizens. And just hearing that, you know, it's 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 pretty um, horrifying because, <laughs> especially when you think that um, I I I left Iran and I come from a position of uncertainty, and you uh, come here and kind of migrate migrated and have a life here, but then you realize not safe here either, <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's it's quite interesting to see that the what, what the the you know it's. Um, People in America sit here and they think, oh, horrible things are happening in Iran, but really horrible things are happening right now here too. Um, and we should really be diligent and, and ask and make people accountable, the people on top accountable uh, for this kind of situation so they won't get out of hands um, and get, because it can grow if we stay silent, it can, they can do more and more and eventually uh, it's not, you know, that's, that's how, um, you have regimes like, you know, like um, Iran, basically. <laughs> or, or regimes like the Trump administration. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, exactly. So what they're doing right now, it, it, what I'm saying is if you don't stay on top of it and keep them accountable and ask, because that's what happened at the border in Blaine when, you know, people came and said, this is what happened to us. So the journalists started questioning it and then kept asking. And at first they denied that there was such a thing. But then one of the uh, uh, guys who worked at the patrol said, you know what? No, we were told and here's the memo. And he basically, if he didn't, hadn't said that, they were going to keep denying that such a thing actually happened. Um, but, you know, that diligence is required because if you stop doing that, then people just get used to this kind of happenings and it becomes an everyday occasion. And all of a sudden you have um, uh, authoritarian governments. Absolutely. 
So I want to thank you so much for joining us. And I want to remind folks that the link to Salome's website is in the comments on Facebook, and we will put that in other places as well, as well as the link to her Instagram account so that you can follow her. Any final thoughts as we end? Uh, well, um... Well, uh, thank you uh, so much. I, I this, this thing that I wanted to say, uh, uh, again, back to being an, uh, a woman um, in Iran, just to give perspective how um, uh, each, each society can have different levels um, looking from outside or inside. But in Iran, uh, I, when I was in university, I did my undergrad and graduate in there. Uh, my, the, the head of my university, the, the dean of my university was a woman. When I started working, my boss was a woman. I started working in a factory, she was a woman. Um, I went to Japan, uh, the university that I went, I did my master's. I, there was only one female um, university uh, professor, everyone else were men. And then when I started working, I didn't have, and the company that I worked, uh, there were no women in positions of power in Japan. So, you know, these are obviously just uh, personal anecdotes uh, from just one experience of an individual, but just to give perspective that um, society can have multiple, uh, multiple faces and um, just and I, something to think about. I believe it's that around, uh, you can tell me if this number is correct, but around 60% of uni university students in Iran are women. Yeah, yeah, that number is, uh, yeah, one of the things that uh, comes up often. It's it's quite normal for Iran because, um, uh, first of all, uh, we have free education in Iran uh, and um, definitely, um, because I think a part of it is um, a lot of uh, boys, if they don't get into university the, the first year, they will have to go to a mandatory um, military service. So a lot of the females end up being the majority of the, the university. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the correct number. And I think uh, in higher, uh, like in masters and PhD programs too, I think females are the, um, the have majority. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to speaking with you again and continuing to uh, work with you and um, continuing to work to prevent a war and get these sanctions lifted. Yes. Well, a war is happening right now. So trying to um, end this war. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.